Okay. Of the three. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Piranha Tank. Um, real quick, um, just a couple of housekeeping matters. I'll introduce some of the panelists. Um, just want to thank Andy Zizos and the CFO Studio to uh, have this event. We're uh, very much looking forward to present uh, four very promising young companies who are here to have their ideas critiqued by three very distinguished panelists. Um, myself, my name is Greg Kammerer. I'm the head of capital markets at MLG Capital uh, and a strategy consultant for startup venture companies. With me directly here, I have Catherine O'Neill, the head of uh, New Jersey Angel Network. Catherine is a seasoned Fortune 100 uh, finance executive as well as she's part of uh, incubators as well as TechLaunch. Uh, Gil Beta. Founding founder and managing partner with Genicas Ventures. Uh, Gil started a couple companies and has sold to uh, Google twice, as well as, um, what's the other large one? Uh, Adobe. Uh, Adobe, yeah. Uh, and Stephen Lassise, uh, who is a startup, who is uh, very intimately involved. He had um, a managing partner at TechCXO. Uh, they provide uh, Stephen um, fractional interim consulting service as well as uh, guidance to uh, early stage technology companies. Thank you. Um, with us um, first will be Tad Slap of Innovance. Um, real quick, just to let you know, there is no actual exchange of cash in this section of the product <laughs> tank. Uh, I did want to get that out real quick. Uh, but Innovance is an innovative new company that's looking to put a spin on how individuals and companies can use big data to unlock their trading theories with stocks. Tad? Thanks a lot, Greg. And Appreciate everyone making it out tonight. Um, everyone hear me okay? So let's say that you wanted to buy Apple stock, and you had a theory that the quarterly earnings report was important, maybe you wanted to look at volume and Twitter sentiments. Now, what are you gonna do with that theory? You could go out, gather all that data yourself, try to analyze it on a complex, multivariate time series analysis, but unless you have a really strong quantitative background, it's really not gonna go that well. So you're basically forced to use your own basic analytical skills, trust some expert that you've never met, or rely on an outdated newsletter. The point is, none of these are really good options. At Innovance, we're making intelligent, robust analytics accessible to everyone. By easily leveraging machine learning algorithms, you can uncover patterns in the data that you care about. With our platform, to select the data, we use algorithms to analyze it for you, and then we show you the patterns that they were able to uncover. So in a matter of minutes, you've gone from a rough general investment idea to a strict, mathematically supported investment strategy. Now we're targeting the 16 million self-directed active individual investors in the United States. And just since our launch in March, we've had our user base grow 10% week over week, and have over 300 users. Now, not only do our users love us, but we've attracted the attention of some of the largest online brokerages in the world who are desperate to provide these type of analytics to their user bases. In fact, we're already in the onboarding process with TD Ameritrade to become one of their registered partners. Now, my background is in data science and machine learning. Our chief operating officer, Justin, is a proven project manager who's an active trader himself. And our CTO has his master's in computer science from Stanford, has built these trading systems on Wall Street, and spent the last 20 years designing enterprise level software. The product is built, we have the team together, and a growing and loyal user base. So we're gonna be asking for a million dollars in exchange for 20% of the company in order to expand our team, expand to new assets, and scale up our marketing. Thank you. Uh, Tad, real quick, um, maybe explain who your other competitors are in the market space and, you know, what sets you apart from them. Sure. So a vast majority of other co doing companies, other companies like this are targeted towards larger financial institutions and institutional traders. And they're charging, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 per month for analytics similar to this. On the individual side, targeted towards our users, there's a lot of companies that are focused much more on automation. So Quantopian is one of the big ones in the news that just raised a lot of money. But what really sets us apart is we're not just automating existing strategies. We're helping you come up with new strategies and then implement those to your trading platform. 
We're asset agnostic, broker agnostic, platform agnostic, and we're up and live running now. So if you're selling directly to uh, individual users, how do you really gather those users? How do you grow so fast? Yeah, so basically we have three different distribution channels. So number one, we have a really strong content marketing and inbound marketing campaign. So just writing blog posts. The good thing about our target market is traders are always out looking for new ideas, looking for new ways to grow. So we've grown, every, all our growth so far has been entirely organic inbound. Um, the second is by leveraging the distribution networks of brokers. So brokers love us because it's adding value to their clients in terms of giving them ways to come up with new ideas. We integrate directly with the broker's platforms and we easily automate existing strategies. So either having leveraging the distribution networks of them through an affiliate model or licensing it directly to the brokers allows us to really grow quickly. And then the third is we've already started working with online trader networks, data providers, and other service providers that have complementary technology. Yep. Nice job, nice presentation. So can you talk a little bit about you know whether it works or not? So you know a, you know a user puts in you know a, a stock and and then you know something you know pops out and a buy or a sell or some trending, and um, how do you get the user comfortable that this is something that they should trust and yep. and how do you know that it works? Yeah, so that, that's a great question, the one that we get a lot. So the focus of ours is we're able to quantify and test out your own theories about the market. So it's not us telling you what to do. We're based, we're showing you the patterns in there. It's an analytics tool. So in that earlier example, you would select Apple stock, volume, Twitter sentiment, and quarterly earnings. And then we show you, all right, in the past, we found a strong relationship between these values and a price increase. So the user then can test out to see how well that strategy would have performed and then easily test it live on new data. So it's your idea, we're showing you the patterns, and then it's still your strategy. So there's no black box, it's completely transparent. So it's really just making the analytics process a lot more streamlined, so you're not spending hours in Excel or MATLAB or R, but very visual, robust analytics, and then very actionable. And of the 16 million, I think you mentioned, yeah. um, uh, you know, folks who are, who are currently trading, you know, consumers who are trading, how many of those do you think are sophisticated enough to be able to put in these inputs here and then be able to uh, you know, read the outputs and, and, and uh, you know, create their own strategies? Yeah, so our initial market, kind of the beachhead market, if you will, are more active. So individuals who trade more than three or four times a month. And there are, I think, 3.5 million of those, according to the latest numbers, um, who we, it's really, I mean, it's a very three-step process. It's like the data, analyze, it's all a visual interface. But a lot of the value proposition right now is geared more towards active traders. But really the big vision is to become the de facto analytics platform for the financial markets. So whether you're just interested in, hey, should I buy Apple stock this year? Or you're some guy who's trading, you know, five times a week, we are going to be that tool. So um, it, just uh, on that point, it sounds like you're providing a set of tools. The user has to engage with you. Yep. There's, there's um, some discussion in your literature about AI and sort of how that may work. Do you see this eventually moving into more of a trading strategies platform where you've you've developed a a, a thesis around a long protection, asset protection, various different strategies? So where, where do you see the vision for the product going now that you have this fundamental capability? Yeah. So for the next you know three three to five years, our focus is really in this vertical of you know trading tools, financial software. We've got a lot of interest. Uh, for risk analytics. But looking out beyond that, we see a lot of other horizontal expansions. Because really what we're doing is allowing non-technical users the ability to analyze a wide variety of data. So we see the growth in industries like the Internet of Things or you know um, wearables, where all of a sudden users have this data that's very unique to them. They want to analyze it. And our software being data agnostic doesn't matter whether the underlying data is price, Maybe it's the number of hours you slept last night or the machines in your house or in your industry. So to answer your question, next three years, it's very focused on this vertical. But beyond that, we really want to become more of a general purpose analyst. So, so just on that, on that strategy, if, sure. you get, if you assume that you have uh, adoption of your solution yep. across the board, you have now a new engagement with traders, what is your view? Are you basically going to take the alpha out of the market and turn it into beta in that in that scenario. Do you worry about that? Are you are you are you fundamentally, if everybody has equal access to information, 
are you basically then just setting the bar again for the performance of the market? We would love to be in the position where we're <laughs> doing enough to actually take away alpha out of the market. But our, I mean, our tool is there's really limitless possibilities in terms of the data that you're feeding into it, in terms of your time horizons, in terms of how you're interpreting the output, in terms of how you're actually applying these strategies. So unless you're, you know, we all of a sudden become very focused on an illiquid, smaller market, I don't really see that as a concern. And like I said, if it ever did become a concern, that would be great for us. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Tad. And um, anybody who's interested, we are going to hold questions for the rest of the group, and we will introduce you guys to the end after. But um, we'll hold questions till the end. Okay. Right. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So our next company uh, fits a little bit different of a niche. Uh, have you ever wondered what somebody was doing in Russia or had the need to make a new friend in Germany uh, but still be able to understand what they're saying in their language? Well, Kevin Strom, with his company Globe Chat, looks to help meet that need. Kevin? Hey, everybody. There are 7.3 billion people in the world. Um, that's not necessarily the most critical element of my presentation. However, since this is a CFO summit, I thought I'd start off with numbers to get your attention. So there, communication has evolved throughout the years. We have evolved through the telegraph. We have evolved through the radio, uh, the television. Then came the internet. After the internet, now we have social media which is really supposedly have brought the world a lot closer together. However, the problem with social media is people still stay within their own cultures. They stay within people that they feel comfortable with. You connect with people you went to high school with. You connect with people that you're very familiar with and, and people that are like you. The thing that I've seen, I've traveled 60 countries, and I've seen that as I travel that you get to know people, the only difference that divides us is the language that we speak and the distance between us. So we set out to bridge that gap and to have one global communication hub where everybody in the world can simply and easily have access to talk to anybody else. It could be on any device. We have set it up so you can use it on a handheld device. It'll work on an Android device. It'll work on Windows. Um, it'll work on Apple devices. It'll work on tablets and desktops. We translate 41 languages to 41 other languages. Uh, you can do it in one-to-one -one chat rooms. It's as simple as texting. So if you're sending a text to someone, they will see it in their own language. You can send photos, video, audio files. We also have group texting that you can do. If you have a group of friends, say you, um, I'm going to use CFOs because it seems appropriate here. Say you have CFO counterparts around the world and you want to talk to them about how they do their accounting or their spreadsheets, you can set up a private group. There could be 20 other CFOs around the world in that group. None of you speak the same language, and everything that you send to them, they will see in their individual languages. Then the greatest part about this whole thing is we have uh, set up a multi-language simultaneous chat. Uh, we believe we're the first in the world to do it. We have intellectual property patents that are going through right now, and trademarks as well for our company. What this means is you can get into a global chat room with 40 people from 40 different countries on a common topic. None of you speak the same language. Everything that you put into that chat room, every one of the other 40 people will see it in their language. So now we're connecting people based on commonalities. So it's no longer um, distance and language that are a barrier for us. Uh, we've taken, am I close? I'll, I'll wrap it up here. It's been four years in the process. Uh, we actually launch in two months. Uh, we're out here in New York. Thursday night, we're having our actual launch, launch party at the Gan Gansevoort Hotel. Uh, you guys are all welcome. And we're just uh, really ecstatic. It's, it's taken a million dollars, four years, 30 programmers are working on this full time. And we truly believe that we will be the first global communication hub in the entire world. So we are ecstatic right now. I haven't slept much in the last four years, but now I'm actually getting out and talking about it, so it feels good. Thank you. Kevin, um, why don't you tell us a little bit more of your, you know, your pricing model for your products? You have a lot going on. So the pricing model for our products, it is good. we want to make it free and accessible for everybody in the world. So uh, Globe Chat will be a free service. It is free for everybody, and I know you guys are good with numbers. You're thinking, how are you guys going to make money if you offer it for free? 
We want to do something good first. We want to service the world. Since we have the intellectual property patents on the actual multi-language translator, we're going to take that and put it into other branches that do generate revenue. Uh, each one of those branches will be very simple to do because we've already done 90% of the work. We just resurface it. So we'll have a global dating site. Uh, we'll have um, a global site maybe for people who like wine. We'll have global sites. So we'll just keep rebranding re it with the same engine, basically, and a new uh, chassis to the car. I'm assuming you have betas right now that have been in effect. How, how have they gone? Because this seems like something nice to do, but not necessarily something that people are going to be driven to unless they're involved in an international organization or uh, which may drive membership. What? Right. Um, over the course of the last four years, we've done two betas. Uh, the first one that we did was on Facebook. Um, we just wanted to, to test the actual translation process first. And the, the feedback that we received was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, the second thing that we did is we actually set it up. Uh, it's actually still live right now. We took 150 people around the world, random people, and we set them up on an actual our actual website, our beta website. And again, it was absolutely incredible. I, I was on for two hours and it seemed like five minutes because it's just so fascinating to talk to people from other cultures. It was the first time and you know, you, you, you learn everything about your own culture, but when you start talking to people from around the world, it just makes it so interesting and fascinating. So time goes by quick because you're, I mean, if you guys are like me, you just love to travel, you like to meet new people, and now it gave us that opportunity. So to answer your question, the, the pilots went incredibly well. And everyone likes it for different reasons. So to, to monetize it, how fast do you have to move in these other categories? Or, or how much money are you looking for now to monetize the business? Uh, right now, we are fully funded up into the actual launch of the product. Uh, what we're looking for is the next round of funding is going to be just for the growth and acceleration of the product. Uh, we are actually, Discovery Channel is actually here this week. They're going to be filming us uh, this week um, on a show called Innovations. Uh, we're going to be on CNN, Fox Business News. Um, we're trying to get it adapted as quickly as possible because the sooner that we get a large user base is the sooner that we can start branching off to the different revenue models. Uh, we also have celebrities that are involved with our company. Um, I'm a former film producer, so fortunately I have access to, to all of them. And they are, some of them are even investors in the company, and they're just waiting for us to physically launch so they can send out millions of tweets as well. So that will help us get to a revenue model quicker. Um, projections are just projections for something like this, but we project that anywhere between 13 and 18 months is when we will become cash flow positive. And from that point, we hope to just have explosive growth and also at the same time do something that's good for the world. So it seems like a, an interesting platform. Clearly, it took a lot of time and money to develop it. But I'm wondering if it's a solution for looking for a problem. Um, I understand the technology behind it, and it could be used for so many things, which sometimes can be an awesome positive. But you know, what do you look at as the killer app here? Like, why do you people in this room or other people, you know, wh why do we care? Wh why would we need something like this? Right. Uh, the market size for this is, is, is pretty massive. And everybody that you talk to has a different reason for using it. Obviously, it's not for everybody. And no, you know, if you invented a new toaster, the market size is small. For us, the market size, there, there's 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, the 41 languages that we support cover 57% of the people who speak on this planet. So our actual market size is 4 billion people. So maybe it's someone who wants to talk to their mother-in-law that they've never spoken with in Romania. And we do have a Skype aspect to it where basically you can see the video and maybe the grandmother doesn't really speak the, the language very well. There's a keyboard at the bottom. She types in Romanian. You see it in English. The killer, some of the other killer apps that I think will adopt quickly are education. There are just millions of students around the world that want to learn other languages. And it's so much easier when you have someone else who wants to learn your language. So if you're trying to learn Russian or Japanese, and you're on a Skype call with someone, and you're talking, and there's the ability to have a keyboard at the bottom where you can type, I didn't understand that last word that you said, now you're also making friends from other countries as well. So I think um, education is going to be one that's where we've seen a lot of positive feedback. 
And um, I've had a lot of messages from other countries for, I know this is horrible, but global dating, it's, it seems to be a pretty big market for people that want to meet their perfect match from other countries that might not speak the, the same language, uh, but you can filter. Our site also offers filters. So that's, I mean, there's so many different ways. So I don't know what the killer app's going to be, and I'm excited to find out, actually. All right. Stephen, you have a cool question? I, I do. So you had mentioned earlier the, uh, the core IP was around the translation uh, and, and that's uh, where you've spent a lot of your resources building up. So why not, why not instead of trying to replicate a new network or create a new social network, why not leverage the existing networks that are out there and just become their translation tool? I mean, that would, it would seem like that's the, the ability to target a very large audience, right. to bring them value that you have a tool that doesn't exist um, and, and you'd be able to get out to market, market quicker, you'd build right. your brand recognition, and maybe at some point you become the, the, the tool that they acquire for that. I mean, you know, uh, Snapchat, you know, other, others have taken that path. Why not, why not right. that as an alternative and, um, and building the, the social network? Absolutely. Uh, we are going for the B2B market as well. We, we have had been, been in a lot of talks for that as well. Um, the social aspect uh, is just one branch of it. Uh, we are going to go after the um, the business markets as well, and we will do that. However, our intellectual property is based on the multi-language translator. We're we're actually on uh, we're utilizing the Open API for Bing Translate, where our uh, intellectual property is is the multi-language simultaneous translator that sits on top of that. So what we're going to do is we are going to go after the business markets as well. It's it's just. The possibilities are so limitless is we're going to pursue every path, and if that turns out to be the one that is the most successful, we'll pursue that the hardest. But we're just going to get it out there, and we're going to pursue every path available to us. And, and you had referenced premium to free. Sounds like everybody's getting free. What's the What are the features that you get under the premium? How are you thinking about structuring the right. to, to encourage people to, to pay up for the service? and? Okay, so the, one of the reasons we want to offer it for free, what we've done on the, the site, the, the whole goal for us is to get as many people on it as possible. There are filters. When you sign up for the site, you can add as much or as little information or data about yourself as you want to. Um, so you can actually add, I mean, you can be as specific as uh, controversial topics such as politics and your religion. You can also add your favorite hobbies, your interests. Um, so basically, we have a data collection site for people all over the world. We know where they live. So say you live in Chicago, you speak Russian, and you list on the site that you have dogs and cats. Um, you're gonna get a Petco coupon by email in Russian, not necessarily, you know, it's gonna be in whatever language um, that you speak. And again, um, going back to where we start generating revenue is with all this data, if we see, we'll just take everyone, when the, the site gets big enough, we will simply send out messages to everyone that says they like wine, and all of a sudden, we'll be catering to the wine audience. If we have a global wine site, when we start the, the dating app, we're going to cater specifically to anyone who puts themselves on the site as single or divorced. Um, we'll, we will specifically target them. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next we have uh, a page right out of the straight from your science fiction novel. We're turning into a little bit into reality with Russell Hansen and his team. Uh, they'll be telling you how to back up the most important computer you have, your brain. Hello, my name is Mihai. I'm the chief business officer of a company called Brain Backups. And that's because we're really, really, really ambitious. But that doesn't mean that we're not starting small, and that doesn't mean that our product isn't monetizable today. What we are looking to do is map the entire brain, neuroreceptor by neuroreceptor. In order to do that, you need to have what's called a marker, which is able to be a thousand times more accurate than today's most accurate MRI. So you can actually see every neuroreceptor site, every synapse that's undergoing there, and see a little blink that will allow you to understand what you're really looking at. So we started with that technology, um, we're out of Mount Sinai, and over the last couple of years, we've developed the first really neuroreceptor level accuracy detector uh, for dopamine and alpha-synuclein. Those are the first things that we're working on. Right now, as of a month and a half ago, 
we just got some really good data about GABA. None of these words might mean a lot to you. I'm sure all of you know GABA because that's a neuroreceptor that gets triggered when you get drunk. And that's in about half of your body. The other half is called glutamate. It's about 90% between those two. And then the rest of the 10% are, you know, stuff like dopamine that makes you feel pleasure, stuff like serotonin that may or may not make you feel depressed depending on what pills you're on. But really, what we're trying to do is to provide a way to do diagnostics. It's a way to provide um, tools for researchers so that research can go faster. And in those fields like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, where you're seeing Eli Lilly lose $2 billion over buying a diagnostics agent that can't be approved for reimbursement because you have no treatment, we want to be right in there where they're doing the research and give them the finest possible metrics they can to see how all of the drugs that they're trying are working to a neuroreceptor level. So you can see that neurodegradation live. That's where we make money today. We're hoping that 20 years from now, with enough funding, we can do one of these aptamer-based neuroreceptor markers for every single one out there. And once we get that whole set of 64, it's like Pokemon, once we collect them all, we can do the entire brain. And that means we can understand memory. That means we can, hopefully, back up your brain. So the quick question is, does, does it work? Uh, well, yes, it works in mice. We have been able to <laughs> actually get the data from um, GABA and from alpha-synuclein, which is the most profitable market for us now. We worked with uh, uh, the Mass Biotechnology Council to help us identify the first most useful market. And so this would be uh, enabling you to see the precursors to Lewy bodies that cause Parkinson's. Um, or the tau, which would also help you, uh, you know, diagnose concussions and look at the level of uh, neurological damage that could ensue and sort of create a predictive uh, treatment um, management. So are you staying in mice right now as a product to sell to researchers, or how long will it take you to get to humans? Well, um, you know, unlike some of the other apps out there, we can't just put it on Facebook or, you know, going from mice and seeing that it works in mice to humans is a long, drawn-out and involved process. So the low-hanging fruit is research. I think we could be useful to AstraZeneca and Pfizer in their current research today. Um, I don't think we're allowed to be useful to anybody else right now uh, because we haven't gone to clinical trials, because we haven't gone through that level of testing. And this is why I'm here standing today begging strangers for money so that we are able to actually go through that process and show the validity and safety of uh, our techniques. And so how much time and how much money will it take you to be able to validate that for a product to be used for research? Um, so we've got some really good connections to uh, folks in that field. So they would supply us with models. We're talking sheep, um, monkeys, about $2 million. And two and a half, two years should get us to humans. The early stages of, of humans, we can get through monkeys for about half a million dollars in about a year. So all the way up to, um, to humans, which, you know, so if you want to do like kind of a, a tiered or a tranched approach to an investment, for example, that's where we would be setting the milestones per model. And then as we would be moving on, obviously, you would be looking at a B round by the time you're, you're really getting to humans. Can you talk a little bit about the competitive landscape? Because it would seem like the existing imaging companies, you know, the GE, the Siemens, whomever, that they have... You know, billion dollar businesses and probably have budgets of hundreds of millions of dollars to, to figure these things out. How is it that sort of small, a small company like yourself can compete against, you know, researchers and R&D departments and, and budgets, um, like, like those guys? Well, so I'll give you an example. You brought up GE. They have a great technology called the DAT scan, dopamine active transfer scan, which is an MRI, uh, technology that basically tells you how much active dopamine you have. It's a bit of a very rough oversimplification, but you get this weird heat map. And then the way you diagnose Parkinson's with that is you hand it to a neurologist, you look at the weird heat map, and you go, uh, probably. Um, their internal tests were about 99% efficacy, it's the best in the world, blah, blah, blah. Once you get out into the field, unless you spend a year training people in the lab on how to actually read that map, it's still not a lot better than noticing if somebody shakes or using those pieces of software that look at eye movement. Um, the answer is, to put it bluntly, that nobody really finds it worthwhile to invest resources in that level of micro-mapping. So it, it's, it's been kind of like the obvious thing that's been hidden in the light, right? Like, 
if you're able to get that level of accuracy, you can not only do Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, you can do a whole host of diseases. And I think for a lot of those guys, they've just been really looking at how does this piece of research get me to a treatment, right? If you have an average drug development cost of two and a half billion dollars, you really want to know from day one what this piece of active research is going to get you in terms of treatment. Whereas we've been looking at it from, you know, the kind of sci-fi, like, let's map the whole brain from a couple years ago, and then came from there to how are we going to do it, let's develop this very narrow piece of technology that will give us the resolution we need. That's really all we focused on is developing that resolution that's a thousand times better than today's MRI. So a couple of thoughts. I mean, uh, typically when we... Uh when I, when I hear pitches for early stage companies and I see a couple of million dollars raised, I'm like, all right, I can get my arms around that. But I very rarely see like the hundreds of millions of dollars referenced as what it takes actually for the company to be successful down the line. So, and, and I, I sort of share your passion when I went through the materials and I, and I, and I detail all of the, the cures that you're going after. I think it's a great cause. My, my sort of pushback to you though is, why is it a great business? So why does an investor want to be part of this and basically, you know, support you along the way? And and I'm not saying I'm skeptical. I'm just mm -hmm. saying just from an outsider looking yeah. in, it's, it's very hard to sort of bridge those two because I, I was was not sort of hit with why do you need it? I mean, mapping the brain sounds great and, and sort of like what drives that? And, and I'd, I'd sort of put it to you just to just maybe say, why do you think this will be a great business? Well, this is why I was trying to bring it back to Parkinson's because I, mm -hmm. I think you need to kind of pick a field mm -hmm. and really say we can make it a business in this, even though standing, you know, from an early stage, you can say we're here's these hundred different directions we can go in. Uh, One percent of the Parkinson's market as diagnostic tool uh, would be about a hundred million dollars a year, right? Like that's always the kind of the kind of percentage you're trying to get is one percent of the market to a hundred million dollars a year, and that's why we we're really focusing on Parkinson's. Uh, the advantage to it is that if it becomes if it is as effective uh, as we think it is, and we get that level of resolution, you're not just going to want to use this pure diagnostic, which still gives you about eight years of ramp up time, like before you would get any other diagnostic tool would would give you the yes. You would also be able to use it as treatment management. And that repeat use really is where you go from that hundred million dollars to you know three four hundred a year. And again, as you're getting that initial funding, what that allows us to do is to protect that AP uh, for every type of neuroreceptor. That's really what we need the money for. First is get that IP out there and really establish ourselves as a platform company that has a chance to grow beyond a single field into a really diversified area. So, so take Parkinson's mm -hmm. as an example. The detection piece I get, where's the value inflection of early detection? That's the piece I'm missing. So if it's detected later, your, your, I think your argument is that we have a better way of detecting it. Great. So what's the, what's the return on detecting it early versus detecting it later versus traditional methods that are currently available? So there's 34 uh, treatments that are currently in the pipeline. There's no clearly approved, like, mm -hmm. massively effective treatment out there. Um, but a lot of studies have been showing towards, say, neuroprotective effects of L-DOPA, or even physical activity. So being able to get it pre-symptomatically would mean that you would be able to change your diet or change your behaviors or have certain non-toxic treatments that have been shown to be neuroprotective, ginkgo biloba, or whatever it really is. As that research is progressing, you're really trying to get that, that ramp up and be able to delay the onset of, of symptoms. Once you're getting to the point that, yeah, you've already gotten to you know, symptomatic level, we're not offering that much of a, of a difference there. What we really would be able to do is say, okay, well, there's these five different drugs, and because so much of Parkinson's is not idiopathic, it's not the, the same kind that sort of affects everyone, there's a whole bunch of different flavors of it, they're all different, difficult to diagnose. About 15% of, of the, uh, the Parkinson's diagnosis is atypical, and there's a lot of flavors within that. It's going to be very difficult to diagnose and very difficult to pick the right treatment. So for those 15%, we're really important part of the process because we can tell you what part of the brain is being affected most, what's going to be affected as you, if you especially do it over the course of a couple of months again, you're really noticing the progression and then you know, does this drug work? No, let's change it now. Not wait two years and say, oh, you have gotten considerably worse, so I guess this wasn't working. 
which is quite literally the way that it's working today. That's great. Thank Thanks you. so much. Now, how many of you guys have one of these in the audience? Probably been collecting 30, 40, 50 today, right? <laughs> well, what Andrew Amon wants to do is take the business card and turn it into an ego. Hey, Darren. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for having me. Uh, so my name is Andrew Amon, and I'm the founder of Inigo, and uh, we are here today seeking $250,000 convertible note for a 6% discount. Uh, companies have the opportunity today to measure everything that their visitors do on their website, from understanding how many people view their pages, click on the links, and engage with your brand. What if you could gain the same level of insight in a person-to-person -person interaction between your employees and potential leads? Our app, Inigo, allows your employees to instantly exchange contact information with anyone at any time. But what's even better is that as you as the account manager have the ability to measure when those employees' cards are clicked, how many times they're viewed, and how many times those people engage with your brand. You and your employees can create unlimited number of cards. And you can store anything besides just contact information like phone numbers and emails. But you can include links that go directly to your LinkedIn, your Twitter, your Facebook. I mean, anything, you name it. But instead of handing over a business card, your employees are out there collecting information and storing that imp information into one centralized database. Then they can save that information with personalized notes, follow-up information, and details about that person so you can understand what are actually valuable leads. In return, they are sharing their cards with any device that's connected to the internet. It doesn't matter if it's an iPhone or an Android. As long as it's connected to the internet, you can see what an Inigo card is and you do not have to download anything or open an app. As a business owner, you created your brand. You hired all of your employees. And then you gave those employees a tool so that they can meet clients so that you can sell more of your product. Shouldn't you own the contact information that they are receiving? Shouldn't you take back all of that information that you have lost for years to come from the people migrating out of your business? That's what Inigo is here to do, and that's what Inigo is going to change. Andrew, um, maybe you can explain what the difference is between some of these apps where I've actually seen them scan the card versus your product. Mm -hmm. It's the same type of question we get with what are our competitors. Uh, there are very good apps out there that do what they call OCR recognition, which take text on a business card or a piece of paper, and they convert that to usable information like a business card transfer. Uh, but what that is doing is it's taking the interaction from the person you meet and doing that, that transaction of data at a different time. So we don't believe that they're some of our competitors because they have a very good process in doing that. They have secretaries or people supporting the transfer of that information. What we're looking at is the introduction with two people standing across from each other or two people across the world and how that data can be transferred at that introduction point. And that's why we're storing the data immediately from that point to a centralized database. How long has your product been released and what's the current status of the sales? Sure. Uh, we released the Android app in December of 2013. Uh, we currently have 50,000 customers. Uh, we have 40,000 accounts. And every month, we have about 10,000 active users. So at this current point, we are released for Android, iPhone, and our Windows phone is in beta. Uh, and we tar targeted the market in verticals. Uh, we first went after social media. We believe that it was easier to focus on how people interacted with social business cards using social media. Uh, as of last week, we started using the vertical of going after realtors. We believe that there's a huge market in how realtors use their business cards and transfer information. So our next vertical after we've gone after social media is for realtors. So what is the revenue model? It sounds like you would want to be able to sell it to a business first. But Correct. It can, but can individuals buy it too? Yes, of course. So if you download the app today and you go onto the feature, we have what we call a history feature. And so as you tr transfer cards, you know, at this event, let's say you handed out 25 cards. You look at your history feature and all the names that you transfer those the, with the people that you met, you can see when they view your card as a timestamp. And then you can see how many times they clicked on your card. And pretty soon you're going to see what they clicked on. So if you had promotional material, a Facebook link, and a LinkedIn material all on your card, you see what they actually clicked on. So you can find out if that person's a valuable lead. But what our business model is for an employer is if you're an account manager and you have 10 sales guys out there running around the world trying to sell your product, one guy's you know in California, another one's over in Russia, you want to make sure that that information that they're getting and that they're trading with the people and all the contact information that they're collecting is being stored back to your business. 
immediately so that you can see right after the event, call the guy up and say, hey, you just met Mark Cuban. Did you know that that was Mark Cuban? You know, I saw the name. Go back and meet him. He might be a valuable lead or something, you know? So it allows real-time information of transfer so that you as the account manager, and that's, that's where the business model is. You pay for that data to have all the accounts rolled up into one database. So, so there have been a number of companies who have tried to replace the business card, and uh, I'm sure you, you hear this a lot. You know, the reason why the business card is so effective is because it's universal and it's super easy. Correct. Um, and uh, I know, you know, for, for, for my use case, is I collect a lot of business cards, mm -hmm. go, go back to the office, connect with them on LinkedIn, and throw throw the business card out. Perfect. Right? And so, um, you know, uh, you know, there have been applications like Bump who've tried to you know make it super easy. So why, why you? Why now? You know, I understand the value for the person who has the app. Correct. But most people, you have you know, fifty thousand people, which is very impressive. Mm -hmm. But most people won't have have the app, right? And so, how do you make it equally as convenient for the people who don't have those apps? When we did our market research, when we started the company, Bump had actually just ended. Google had bought them out, and uh, if you guys don't know, Bump is when you take two phones, you bump them together, and it transfers the information from the phone to phone. The problem is that each people have, to, each person that's doing that transaction has to have the app. But a lot of the other competitors and a lot of the people, LinkedIn had had Card Munch, um, which is kind of still teetered. But there's been a lot of attempts at replacing the business card. But when we did our market research, we found that they took the business card, they put it on a phone called it a day and they said this is better than paper because we're saving the environment and you can use it on your smartphone that you have with you all the time. We believe we're the first company to look at this from a business standpoint of what's valuable to the business. Why does a business card exist? It's to transfer contact information between two people when they meet, whether it's online or in person. So by us looking at, at the from the business sense, we believe that we're the first ones to tackle the idea from I'm a business owner and I want my contact information from all my sales guys that are out there and I want to be able to control that contact information so that I can manage it and view the valuable leads. So, like you said, there are a lot of people that have tried to tackle the business card, but we think we're the first introductory management tool. So it's a, a pretty cool concept. Um, I struggle a little bit with the cost of acquisition of the customer, mm -hmm. right? And again, that's where that's where I think a lot of these businesses uh, fall down. The second thing I sort of have a question around is the data that you collect is the big D database somewhere, you know, in the web, and, and you're, you're capturing information. What are you doing with it? Are you monetizing that? I mean, is that part of the revenue model? Are you are the analytics? So just give me a perspective of the privacy issue, because I think there's a, there's a lot of concern around, even on the social networks and the professional networks, um, that you don't want the, the information shared back and forth. Um, tell me tell me why you have to capture it and why isn't it just sort of, you know, uh, not captured as part of the process. Right, so I'll just explain maybe the process too and that might help. When you log into our app, we don't require any passwords. We allow LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Google uh, as the tools you probably already use today as ways to log into our app. So just like you have a Gmail account, you would click on a button and it would take you to Gmail to log in with those credentials. Once you have obtained the information onto our app and you're starting to create a card, it's saved onto our database. And we believe the advantage we have is that, let's say you're LinkedIn and your name is Jim Smith, you might have and want to look for Jim Smith on Twitter. It's going to be very difficult to match those two Jim Smiths. Our app, you know, as opposed to some of the other social networks, have the ability to understand who a business owner is, who they are on Twitter, who they are on LinkedIn. And we understand that's very sensitive information and very secure information. Um, so we go to at length details of when we share a business card, there is, I don't know the number, but there is a lot of characters that protect the identity of that business card so you can't search the person by name and so that it's hidden behind Google. So we're very conscious about the security. Uh, our server itself is very secure and the way we transfer the business cards is very secure because we're still looking for that one-to-one -one transaction and we don't want that information to go out publicly unless the person does want to share it on Twitter then it's searchable and usable by anybody that finds it on Twitter. So. Uh, how, how much money would I need to compete with you and develop a competing product? Mm -hmm. You know, you reference having a, a very uh, popular app that's downloaded and it's of the top six, which is great. Mm -hmm. Just I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, why some smart guys in a garage can't replicate that with money. Uh, we think at this point it can be replicated, uh, you know, pretty conveniently, but 
the development time has taken about two and a half years. Uh, okay. We have four develop three developers now, four developers, I'm sorry, that have supported the app for those years. Uh, and to get to the point that we're at would be great. You could match what we're doing, but we believe where we're going and the field that we're entering to is new territory. And so our vision and our goals are going to be ours until we get there. And so uh, we've been asked a question before. We think it'll take a team of like two to three guys almost a year mm -hmm. to duplicate it. Uh, once they duplicate it, then they'd have to continue to follow our path. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do, uh, seeing as we do have three very seasoned investors up here, I'd like to open up to any questions from the audience of you know what they you might have of them to see what they looked at in these companies. Questions? Yes. In events. In events. Okay. Uh, Tad, do you want to answer that directly? Uh, and generally, um, any insight from you guys from how something like that would be handled? Yeah, I think the, the first line of defense is informing the the uh, the user and uh, letting them know that we're not, you know, that the company is not responsible, uh, you know, for any recommendations of the platform, um, and then to have good, you know, directors and oper and officers insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions? Yes. Kevin, you want to answer that directly? questions to the investors up here. No? Nope. All right. Well, thank you all very much for attending the session. I encourage you to follow up with each one of the entrepreneurs if you have any questions with them. And if you need any introductions, please come find me and I'll uh, facilitate that as well.